So, talk today about uh, practical ways of starting companies. In my experience with uh, Hotmail uh, 15 years ago, and and since then, uh, most recently with uh, Jackstrap. So, uh, the big idea 15 years ago, you know, was for us to provide email uh, for free, but. It wasn't just the free part that made Hotmail as successful as it is today. Uh, my partner and I, uh, Jack Smith and I, we were actually working, uh, both of us were working at a company called Firepower Systems. And uh, the uh, company installed a firewall around our corporate intranet. And that made it very difficult for us to access our personal email accounts. And he had a personal email account at AOL, and I had one at Stanford. And so the simple idea was, uh, for us was, we can access any web page in the world, why can we not access our personal email accounts? That was the genesis of the idea behind Hotmail. So we said, we'll just make email available on the web, uh, and that'll solve our problem. And little did we realize that it did solve just the problem for the two of us, but today for almost 700 million people, and if you, uh, you know, uh, calculate in the aggregate, uh, uh, Yahoo Mail and Gmail and Hotmail together, they solve a problem for one and a half billion people. Uh, so at the core of every entrepreneurial uh, venture, there should be an idea, which really solves some fundamental problem. And if it solves a problem for a large enough market, then you have hit, you know, what they say, jackpot in Silicon Valley. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you the entrepreneurial story of how we got started and what are the kind of uh, uh, issues that we faced and how we overca overcame them. Uh, so after we got this great idea, you know, I wrote a business plan for it and uh, uh, I asked Jack, so what is, what is it that you want to do? Do you want to go and raise money for this and do the marketing or do you want to do the coding for this? And both, or both of us were engineers. Uh, so he said, you know what, I have no idea how to raise money. I will just develop the software, you go and raise all the money. So I said, all right. So I bought a nice suit, uh, made my uh, car and a mobile office, bought a cell phone, which was very expensive in those days, and uh, started calling around uh, venture capitalists. So I called around literally anyone and everyone who had any amount of money, and any money, who said that they would want to invest in, in that ideas. Uh, we went through about 19 venture capitalists. They all turned us down for different reasons. First of all, they said, you know, you are trying to provide something for free, but I already have email with an AOL account or a Netlink account or my internet service provider account. They didn't get the idea. The idea really was not the free portion of, of email, but that it was ubiquitous. You could access your email from anywhere in the world just through a web browser. Uh, in those days, you had to you know, configure software to access your email that was configured to a particular desktop. Whereas in our case, it was truly open and global. Uh, so many others turned us down because we were both only 26 years old. And uh, both of us were working, had experience working at Apple Computer. We actually started our careers at Apple. Uh, but then we were working at Firepower, designing you know, PowerPC-based laptops with designing chips. But really, these days, uh, designing chips is like writing software. You don't, it's the two are not really different. Writing software or designing chips is one and the same thing. Uh, and so, you know, many of them turned us down, and then the uh, 19th one, Draper Fisher Jorgensen, said, we kind of like your idea. Uh, how much money do you really need to, you know, show us that this works? And so we had put together a business plan which put down you know, the kind of expenses that we would incur, how the size of the market, the number of people we would hire uh, to make this happen. And uh, the total was about three and a half million or so. So uh, I said you know, three and a half million, these are the you know, figures. So he said, no, 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 time out. Tell us how much money do you need just to prove to us that it is even possible to make email available on the web. Because in those days, that was a risk. They didn't even think that it was possible to make your email appear as a web page. Um, so then I did some you know, calculation at the back of an envelope. And I said, you know, I think we need about half a million just to prove to you, you know, about four or five developers, six months of development time, 
in those days, salaries of a developer in the US were about 60,000 a year. Uh, so I did some calculations. You need some office space. So we'll give you 300,000. I said, okay, I'll take it. So we started with a very small sum of money, $300,000. And uh, uh, literally, not only did we launch the, prove to them that we could do this, but we launched the company and had 100,000 users uh, before we went in for the next round of financing. So one of the things about entrepreneurship really is that uh, you know, you've know you got to be very frugal when you start. Uh, you cannot have all the resources at your disposal, but disposal, but at the same time, you can you know, build the software and uh, cut on your cost. And that's the beauty of Silicon Valley. You know, people take risks with you. Uh, for example, with this $300,000, we had four or five full-time employees, but we had 15 part-time employees. And all of them, we were paying with stock options or with stock. And with the promise that when we got the next round of funding, we would bring them on full-time. Uh, and, and I think that is part of the culture of Silicon Valley. People take risks with you. I'll give you two other stories. One is that of our uh, furniture provider. He did not take any profit from us. He provided furniture to our company at cost and took all the profits in stock. And sure enough, when the company was acquired by Microsoft, uh, that individual made you know, $200,000. Same thing with our PR firm. And same thing with a little kid whom I, whose father I worked with at Apple Computer. And he was in between school and college. And uh, his father said, you know, instead of uh, him spending time with his friends for the next six months, why don't you, you know, teach him something at your company? He said, you know what, we'll teach him, we'll feed him, uh, we don't have any money to pay him, but we'll give him stock. And two years later, when the company was sold for his six months of work in between high school and college, that stock was worth a quarter million dollars. I mean, this is, happens in Silicon Valley all the time. And that's because of the risk-taking culture. People have benefited from taking risks with startups. And uh, you know what Jaipat said is very true, that it's actually uh, you know, built on failure. You know, because for every 19 companies that fail, one makes it. But the one that makes it more than provides for the 19 failures. I mean, I remember I had put money in a, in a fund uh, called the Angel Investors. And they put, he had put money, this gentleman had put money in 150 companies. And during the dot-com failure of 1999 and uh, 2000, uh, 149 of them completely failed. But the one company that he put a small sum of money, only $50,000 in, was Google. And sure enough, uh, the fund, he returned three times the total investment, the total size of the fund because of one company. Uh, and that's the beauty of the value. You know, people keep trying new ideas. <coughs> Uh, they're not afraid to fail because and failure is part of Silicon Valley. So that was the idea, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, and Genesis was obviously Hotmail. The reason it was called Hotmail was HTML email, and hence Hotmail. Uh, and the big idea today, you know, we've fast forwarded, is actually very similar to the, the entire Hotmail idea. It came to me about uh, over a year ago. Uh, you know, we, we are seeing that there is a proliferation of cellular phones in the world. And there are already five and a half billion cell phones in the world and counting each month. You know, at least uh, 60, 70 million new cellular users are, are added. Uh, and, you know, along with that, you also find that these are increasingly becoming data enabled. And today there are about a little shy of a billion phones that are data enabled. But in the next three to four years, uh, this number is expected to grow from about a billion phones to about all five billion of them will be data enabled. And that's so the next big idea that uh, we think is, is ready for disruption.